I hope that video helped to clearly explain this rule. It's a valuable rule, particularly with C, because when children are spelling words that have the hard k sound, they have to decide if they use C, which is the most common way to spell k, or if they're going to use K. They will have to use K if the vowel following it is E, I, or Y. I called these the watch out vowels when I was teaching to help children remember to look for them when spelling the k sound. The fifth common spelling rule is fairly straightforward. English words do not end in V or U, so students can use this rule to remember that if they hear V or U or U at the end of a word, something will have to follow. The sixth rule involving Q is also a simple rule to teach children. In English, Q is always followed by a U. When I was teaching very young children, I would tell them that Q is a queen and she is not allowed to go anywhere without her bodyguard, U. The number seven spelling rule is the doubling rule. I used to call it the floss rule to help students remember that whenever there is only one vowel in a word and it ends in F, L, or S, you must double the last letter. Some examples of this rule are listed. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule that I simply teach as exceptions. For instance, bus, which is actually short for omnibus, and the word yes. The number eight rule is one that I called the milk truck rule. Basically, if you hear k at the end of a word, right after the vowel, we have to spell it ck, like in truck. If we hear k at the end of the word, but there's another consonant after the vowel, we simply use k, like in the word milk. Later, we, we, we would teach children that the only time c is used to make the k sound at the end of the word is with words ending in ic, like music. Rule number nine is similar to rule number eight in that if you hear ch at the end of a word right after a vowel, you must spell it with TCH, the longer way to spell. But if there is another consonant after the vowel, we can use the shorter spelling, CH. Number 10 follows the exact same pattern for the j sound spelled with G, E, or DGE at the end of words. Obviously, spelling rules are valuable for teaching children to spell words that follow these regular English rules. rules. As was discussed in the video about C and G, just the rules associated with those two letters opened up understanding of thousands of words. So if we start by teaching children basic rules, we can improve their spelling immensely. The next section will address strategies we can use for words that don't follow basic English spelling rules, irregular words. Words that are irregular require special study techniques to help children to improve their visual memory. For children who struggle with other aspects of reading, visual memory can also be an issue, which makes spelling even harder. The first technique I want to talk about is teaching children the copy, cover, and compare strategy. In this strategy, you would have the child say the word, write and say the word, copying from an example, then check their sp spelling to make sure they copy correctly. Then they would trace and say the word again, and then cover that word up and write it from memory. Then they would open up their model and compare it to make sure their correct model matches the word they wrote from memory. This strategy helps students to practice using visual memory to remember words and can be done independently. Another similar strategy involves students using an audio recording of the words they are studying using a self-correction study procedure for more practice. Peer tutoring can also be effective, as can the use of mnemonics involving a visual image to remind students how a word is spelled, such as the word look on the slide. When you're looking for irregular words to use for instruction, you can consult common grade level word lists, such as high frequency word lists. But keep in mind that those may contain decodable words as well that would be better taught using spelling rules or patterns. You can also Google spelling demons and many of the most frequently misspelled words will come up. An additional important source for finding your regular words is looking for words that kids frequently miss in their own writing. The last type of spelling instruction that we will discuss today is morpheme-based instruction. 
We use this for multisyllabic and more complicated words and is typically used with children in the intermediate grades in elementary, so probably third grade and up. Morphemes are the smallest units of speech that have meaning and include root words, prefixes, and suffixes. With this type of instruction, we would teach the meaning of morphemes as in these examples of prefixes and suffixes. Once children understand the meanings of these morphemes, you can begin to teach them the rules that apply for combining them. If we teach both the meanings and the rules, children will begin to master the spellings of even more complicated words. Obviously, there's a great deal more to talk about in terms of morpheme-based instruction, but for the purposes of this lecture, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction. Just as been discussed previously regarding reading instruction, spelling instruction can be maximized if we begin students at the proper place and assess their skills frequently to determine if spelling instruction is working. Some assessment options are curriculum-based measures, which give lists of leveled spelling words administered to students to ascertain instructional level. Level is calculated using total correct letter sequence. This can also be used as a formative assessment. Qualitative inventories, such as the qualitative inventory of word knowledge or words their way assessments, provide lists of progressively more difficult words. The level is calculated using error analysis to determine stage of spelling development. These also provide initial placement and can be used as formative assessments. There are also some, also some standardized spelling assessments that can give you more information, but probably wouldn't be as quick and easy to administer. These might be used for diagnostic purposes, particularly with children with identified disabilities. Lastly, our criterion reference spelling assessments, which could be a teacher-made weekly spelling list. These can be a little bit controversial because oftentimes these lists are not associated with rules or content being studied and may not be words that are of high utility to students. So plan your lists carefully and use caution when using these types of assessments. So today's information came from these sources as well as my own experience. So hopefully today you walked away with a bit of new knowledge regarding spelling instruction. I hope you have a better understanding of the reading spelling connection as well as some strategies for teaching spelling. Please take a minute and answer the final wrap up question. Until next time.